Welcome to another edition of GM Files, and today I am joined by a longtime executive, 40 years in baseball, of course, assistant GM, got it all the way up to the assistant GM of the Chicago White Sox, was general manager of the Los Angeles Dodgers. We actually have uh, consummated a couple of trades along the way. Uh, Jeremy Burnett's going from the Mets to the Dodgers. Dan Evans joins us. Dan, thank you for joining me. I really appreciate it. Good to see you again, as always. And uh, one first question I want to ask you right off the top. Uh, uh, somebody near and dear to both of our hearts, somebody that you identified very early in her career, Kim Ang, who's now the general manager of the Miami Marlins. Um, amazing, amazing story. You hired her as an intern in Chicago with the White Sox. She made her way up through your organization, went off to the Yankees, came back to you for the Dodgers. Can you talk about some of the things that stood out to you about, about um, the qualities that she possessed at the time that make her a good general manager today? Jimmy, first of all, thanks for having me on today. I appreciate it. Um, Kim's a great story, but the best part of the story is her perseverance. She never yielded to the, and you and I have both been there. When you go through that period where you're humbled publicly, where you don't get a job, you know, most other professions, nobody knows that. You know, your local realtor, your local uh, doctor, the lawyer, when you're up for a position somewhere else, nobody knows. In our sport, everybody knows. And Kim stuck with it. Um, I'm thrilled for her. I'm thrilled for our game. And I'm thrilled for society in general. I think it's, a, it's an amazing statement that she shattered that glass ceiling. But she came um, to Comiskey Park Jim, we'd been open for about a month at the new ballpark. And I had my three-month-old daughter sleeping in my office. Um, and I couldn't interview her in my office as a result. So she knocked on the door, came in. And I think that's when I learned who she was. Because she backed off a little bit and she goes, whoa, I didn't expect this. And I said, no, nor did I. But this is where we are. We took a walk around the ballpark, and here's what hit me immediately. And I think it's a great lesson for aspiring baseball people. She just said, listen, I know you're interviewing a lot of people for this job. I'm gonna give you everything I've got. I'm gonna try to contribute immediately and make you better and make your staff better. And I thought it was so unselfish, but it was also so mature for a 21 year old to throw that at me. Jimmy, you know what internships are like. We both started that way, okay? And here's somebody who's among 100 plus candidates and she just shined from the moment she began the interview. In fact, I cut her internship short because she was so darn, darn good. I hired her full time. And the oddest part about it is 10 years later, I hired a completely different person to be the assistant GM of the White Sox, I mean, the, of the Dodgers, she was experienced. She had won three world championships. She'd overseen countless things that hadn't been done when I was with her. And uh, it was funny, I hired her for her winning and her experience 10 years later. So it really makes the whole story even more fun for me. You know, and it strikes me too with her, one more on that I wanted to ask you. So, so I tried to hire with the Mets. I couldn't, I couldn't pry her away from you. you and, it, and it really stuck with me that she was loyal to, to you, to people that she knew, right? So she goes to the Yankees with Brian Cashman. That was her team growing up. But she goes back and she works for you. She's alongside Joe Torre along the way. Uh, after she leaves you, she works for Joe Torre in Major League Baseball's offices. Oh, by the way, she also had a relationship with Derek Jeter with the Yankees. And oh, by the way, now she's joining forces with Derek Jeter and Don Mattingly with the Marlins. Like that also stands out. She could have had other opportunities. She chose to stay with the people she knew that she trusted and that she believed in. And that, to me, is a great quality that gets, I think, overlooked sometimes. Uh, Jimmy, that's a great, great thing for you to say, because when I think Kim, that's what I think. I think loyalty as a friend first, um, as a staff member second, an extraordinary person. I mean, I just love her as a person. But I think she commands respect 
that is very unique, not just in the game of baseball, but in the world in general. She just has a way about her of diffusing a lot of the negatives and making you comfortable. And I think once you work with her, which you have and I have, um, you know, I've worked with her directly. Yeah. It's impossible not to like being around her. And on top of it, oh, by the way, she's brilliant. And she's great at what she does. But that loyalty, I think, is something that is a, is a great character trait. And I think any of us who have worked with her admire that because, Jim, as you know, she could have done anything she wanted the last 30 years. She has that skill set. And as a result, was constantly wooed by a lot of people and just stayed the course, didn't veer off. Our mutual friend, Dayton Moore, always says, do your job really well. You know, that's what Kim does. And as a result, that loyalty is rewarded the other way, where if you work with her, you want her to succeed with you. Yeah, for sure. Um, and her persistence, obviously, we know that. And she, it was a dogged, dogged approach, for, for sure. We're, we're both so pleased and happy for her. I wanted to ask you, because you grew up in Chicago, obviously almost 20 years as a White Sox executive before you went on to the Dodgers. There was recent news with the other Chicago team, yeah, the Cubs. I want to ask you about Theo Epstein. Just because, you know, he just resigned, is going to officially uh, resign and move on to other things. But his his legacy, what he brought to the Cubs, they were in the postseason five of the last six years. They got a World Series ring. I don't think any Cubs fan or anyone growing up in Chicago would have ever said, oh, the Cubs are going to win the World Series. They were almost uh, resigned to that would not happen. Talk, if you would, about, you know, and just obviously being a former general manager, about what he has done for that Cubs franchise. Yeah, Jimmy, I'll tell you what. I grew up in that town. I grew up three miles north of that ballpark. Went to high school about six blocks away. Um, that's my favorite park in North America. And that franchise has always been special to me. My mother was a Cub fan. My dad was a White Sox fan. I was smart enough to play both sides. That way I'd get to go to games with both of them. <laughs> but um, I actually interviewed for that job that Theo just resigned from. And uh, very quietly, and I was thrilled for the opportunity. And when Tom Ricketts called me and told me it was Theo getting the job, I couldn't argue with him. He's got a great resume. He's very talented. As deep down inside, and you know you lose this a little bit in the game, but I grew up a Cub fan. And for what happened in 2016, I will ever be grateful. My mother, that might have been the happiest day of her life. For so many of my friends, that's the day that means everything. And what he did, Jimmy, I think, and I think you and I respect this after being in that post, he changed the expectations of a franchise and a fan base. And I still read the Tribune and the Times every day. I have family and friends there. And suddenly they're not happy when they don't win the World Series, when they don't win the LCS. So I think what he did is he took this really great staff, and he really did assemble a really terrific staff, and they were championship caliber teams. We know how hard it is to repeat in the sport, but he changed the culture of the Cubs. He changed the look of Wrigley Field along with ownership. And, and I'll be honest with you, you know, I, I'm very respectful about what he did because he certainly had about 95 years of a lack of success um, coming in. And that's a really hard thing to chip away with and then eventually win a World Series. Yeah, for sure. He's got three World Series rings, twi twice in Boston. And, of course, broke the curse there in Boston, broke the curse in Chicago there with the Cubs. Um, I want to get to your uh, career, obviously, with the Dodgers when you were general manager there. Uh, go back to those years. And when you think about um, some of the best trades, and one of them stands out for me uh, was trading for Brian Jordan. You had to trade Gary Sheffield, who was uh, obviously a good player at that time. Uh, take us through uh, some of the details, if you would, on, on that acquisition for you. Well, and Jim, you know, one of the challenges of building a club when you inherit it is changing a bit of the culture and changing a bit of the clubhouse. Um, I had some problems with what Gary and his relationship with some of our players was in the clubhouse. 
Um, it's no secret, you know, it, it traveled throughout his career. And I knew it was going to be controversial. I knew it was going to be a difficult decision. So I challenged my staff to try to find opportunities that would benefit the other club as much as ours. Because I think one of the misnomers in the game is if you try to win the deal, not only will you not get the deal done, but you're going to really hurt the other side to the point where you probably can't go back to that club again. Uh, you and I did a couple of deals. And I think, I you know, we both walked away feeling okay with both sides and we didn't try to fleece each other. Well, I was trying to find a leader, somebody who would come in with character, but I also, Jim, wanted to find some left-handed pitching. Some of my staff recommended this guy, that guy, and I, you know John Sherholz extremely well. I called up John and just said, John, I, I just need to shake things up a little bit. Would you have any interest in talking about Sheffield um, in a trade for some of your core players? And I, I know the money is a big deal, but I want to make sure that we're both okay with the trade. And Jim Fergosi, the late Jim Fergosi, an absolutely dear friend of mine, worked with him in Chicago, um, was on the call with John. And Jimmy just said, you know, Danny, I think there's a fit, but I think you're going to have to take some money back. And this was a great example. I wanted character. Brian Jordan's character is unbelievable. One of the best people I've ever met. He also was at the peak of his game, is a two-sport athlete, a great guy, just signed a long-term deal with the Braves. We were lucky. We, we also got Odalis Perez, who turned out to be a really good left-handed pitcher, made the All-Star game his first year. And we got a third pitcher, Andrew Brown, who ended up pitching in the big leagues and threw 100 miles an hour. So a good trade for both sides. But, Jim, the best part of it, and I know you've been through this, I go to the gas station maybe 20 minutes after that deal was done. And the guy in front of me was screaming, literally screaming at the, at the gas station attendant for this stupid trade the Dodgers just made. <laughs> he turns around and sees me and he goes, I guess you don't agree with me. And I said, well, if I agreed with you, I don't think you'd be yelling right now. So I offered him tickets to a game next, the following year. He called me up in late May. Jordan hit a game-winning home run. And the guy waited for me after the ball game. And he said, hey, pretty good deal for me. He said, uh, I got, he says, I got to find out about the trade. He said, I got my gas filled up that day. And I got four great tickets to see Jordan hit a home run. Jimmy, that's probably one of my favorite stories in my career because – the guy just went on forever and the attendant knew me. I, it's the same station I went to all the time. And he kept on looking over his shoulder, smiling like, you know, I'm sorry, dude. I'm sorry. And I was like, that's all right. The trade worked out well. You know, Gary played well the rest of his career and the trade made us a better ball club. So all in all, it's one of those deals that worked out for both sides. Worked out, and, and those are always good to have. Like you said, it, you maintain that relationship. And, and so I think obviously that was important. What, one other um, acquisition, the Hideo Nomo signing, bringing, you know, having him, uh, he, well, that was a re-sign, what, right? Uh, back, or, so is there anything, you know, because he was, when he first came over, he turned himself into obviously rookie of the year and international superstar. Any, any, um, Good stories behind the scenes on having Nomo re, uh, return. Jimmy, I have to give our mutual friend Dave Wallace all the credit for that one. That was an exceptional recommendation. We were looking for somebody who could be a number one, two starter, take a lot of innings. It was a pitching staff that the, the word one of the scouts used was discombobulated, um, which I can't probably spell, but I sure know the feeling. We've both been there. Um, everybody in the organization that I talked to talked about his perseverance, his toughness, his stuff. So we pursued him. Um, Dave was right. He really wanted to come back, knew so many people there, and that's where he got his start six years earlier. So it was exciting as heck for him to come back. Turned out to be one of the best people I've ever been around. Um, you know, Jim, you and I have been around some really good people. This guy is the most resilient, toughest competitor 
I've ever been around. I love him as a person. It's been fun through the last 20 years um, to go back to Japan, see him in Japan when I have been scouting numerous times. I know his son, who's a terrific young executive in baseball in Japan, but Hideo became the tough pitching leader of a club that won 94 games. And the best part about it was when we had the announcement, the turnout for the NOMO press conference was extraordinary. And it opened my eyes to how powerful we could be if we got aggressive again in the Asian market, which we immediately did. We signed Kazishi. We were really aggressive in Taiwan. Uh, we signed three of the first four players to get to the big leagues. But Nomo was a fun story, and I give Dave Wallace all the credit for just really pushing me on that deal. Turned out to be a great, great, great signing. It was, a, it was a great signing for the Dodgers. You talked about characters. Let me segue into some character guys that you traded for. Um, and it's not a coincidence that they all turned out to be uh, big league managers. Uh, Robin Ventura, David Ross, and Dave Roberts. And, and let's specifically stay with Dave Roberts because obviously the Dodgers just won the World Series and he's been the manager. And there's a lot of pressure under, under, around him um, to win a World Series. They had gotten there two different times and hadn't won it. So they finally get there the third time in four years to get the World Series and they get there. It was almost like a, a, a relief. But, you know, as a former GM there and then watching Dave Roberts, who you traded for and now see him as manager, you had to have been pleased for him. Well, in fact, if you look over my shoulder, there's a great shot of uh, Dave Roberts and I at um, Dodger Stadium when he was a giant. We're way down the foul line, just catching up. I love his character. Um, Jimmy, as much character as I've ever been around. Extraordinary human being. He's an army brat. He just has a great family. He's just a superior human being and made himself a player in his late 20s. And when his career was winding down, I said to him, you got to think about coaching because someday you could be a manager. And, um, you know, for me, leaders are born. They just are. They, you know, they – you don't become a leader. You don't become somebody that follows. You just have that. Ventura, unbelievable, extraordinary. Uh, Alex Cora, who's on that team, who was yeah. fantastic. Alex Cora was as good as Rose. But I really encouraged Roberts to get in. And then when he got the coaching job with the pods, Bud Black is a good friend, and Bud raved about him. And then when he became the bench coach, I said to him, hey, you're getting close. You ought to start thinking about who you'd have on your club. And then one day he called me up and said, Danny, I'm interviewing for the Dodger job. I was thrilled for him. And when he got it, I was jacked. I text him a lot. We're friends. Um, I have to be honest, when he won the World Series, and you understand this, Jimmy, when teams win the World Series, you're not really as much a fan of the team anymore. You're a fan of the people. For Dave Roberts – for Stan Cast and a couple guys I really like, for Clayton Kershaw, a guy I just absolutely respect like crazy, it was huge. But for Roberts in particular, because what you mentioned, the pressure of not being good, having to win the World Series, that's a really tough task to carry on your shoulder year after year. Heck, Jim, two of those teams got caught cheating. So there's a, there's a tainted loss there. And I think, you know, what I'm so thrilled for him is that now he's going to go down as one of the better managers in the game's history be, because of the longevity of winning that he's really sustained. What's impressed you about David Ross now that he's managing the Cubs? You know what? He always knew who he was, Jim. He was a 16th round draft pick. Um, I love him. He always knew that he wanted to get into the game afterwards. Think about the people he played under. He played under Bochi, played under Francona, played under, you know, Joe Madden, played under some really great managers. And you could see him evolve. But the best thing, I was with him at the Field of Dreams Labor Day last year, and he knew he was going to probably interview for a couple jobs. And I just said to him, I think you're going to be great, not good. And I think you're going to be great because you communicate as well 
as anybody I've ever been around. Jimmy, I'll tell you what, in our game today, it's not the strategy. It's being able to take those 26 to 28 players and make them feel like they're a part of the club and they can contribute. I think Ross has a huge ceiling. I think he's going to be a heck of a big league manager. Yeah, I do too. He did a great job this year navigating through all the stuff that he had to go through with COVID. And, you know, that team is, uh, you know, it's going to be, a, a, I think, a fun team now under Jed Hoyer, who's going to run the, the, the show there. Uh, I want to go back to your White Sox days for a second. So uh, a couple of acquisitions you were a part of, Canerco, Paul Canerco, Tom Seaver. I know that might have been earlier in your career. Hall of Famer, of course, just passed away, friend of uh, both of ours, uh, Frank Thomas. Mm-hmm. Which ones stand out to you? I know they all have probably different stories. Give me, you have one, t- uh, one tidbit on each of those guys? Wow, three really great people, too, on top of it. Um, Seaver really doesn't predate me. In fact, Roland Heeman and I were in uh, Comiskey Park. We were the last two people in the ballpark. It was about 1230 at night when a compensation list was finalized and we came up with Seaver's name. Fun story, Jimmy. Roland and I come out afterwards. It's 1.30 in the morning, 10 inches of snow coming down in that lovely, warm Midwestern climate. And somebody had ransacked my car, shattered my windshield, punched out both windows on the side. And uh, we cleaned up all the glass. And Roland said to me, Danny, you might have lost a windshield, but we got Tom Seaver. And we were screaming and yelling, driving about 10 miles an hour, driving him home to his condo. Um, Tom was a great guy, the most intelligent player I've ever been around and treated me with so much respect at 25 years of age. Frank Thomas, one of my favorite guys in my life. I love him. Always the same guy, consistently good with all the right people. Never managed up, Jimmy. Always managed down. Just that guy. Um, I never missed an at-bat in the 11 years we were together, and one of my greatest regrets, he wanted to come play in Los Angeles so bad with me, I just didn't have a spot for him, and it crushed me, but I, I love him as a person. I stay in touch with him. I was at his induction ceremony. Canerco was on the back of a golf course at the GM meetings. Um, you understand that. You've been there. Yeah. People wonder why you know you play golf during the GM meetings. Well, when you get somebody on the back of the golf course, they can't go anywhere. And we were able to make a Mike Cameron Canerco deal. And I remember chasing down Ron Schuler saying, Hey, you know, I, I think this could be a heck of a deal. What do you think? And he was all for it. We made the deal. Talk about character, Jimmy. Paul Canerco is as good as there's ever been. Um, I tried to always make that the preeminent thing in every deal. I wanted character makeup all the time. And it comes from my second year with the White Sox when a guy with really bad character turned out to be a big problem on the club. And I always remembered that. And I remembered that from that point forward, if I'm going to have any input, I want that to be the primary focus. Mm-hmm. That's that's good feedback there too. I, I want to ask you, all right, so, so another thing that you I remember uh, reading about I didn't remember this at the time but you had a chance to acquire David Ortiz so another example that we always get into where you make a change make a move and you learn from it that was one also with David Ortiz you missed out on take us through what happened there yeah and Jimmy good call you know and, and I think one of the things being a general manager is you learn from things sometimes you don't do or you didn't do for whatever reason. I was only on the job for a very brief time. I had seen Big Poppy play the previous winter ball season and loved him. Um, I think he was David Arias at the time. And um, his name, our our mutual friend, Terry Ryan, called, wanted to move him, wanted to get him out of the league. He had no spot for him. He said, Danny, I'll, I'll basically hand him to you. We'll make a small deal if we could just move. And I said, Terry, listen, I love him, but this would be my first move. I'm going to go into our staff, talk to our staff, see what their reports are. Give me till the end of the day, I'll call you back. You know what it's like. It's political when you first come in, right? Right. That's right. We didn't like them. Our reports weren't very good. We also didn't cover winter ball very well. 
and we didn't cover the minor leagues quite as well as I probably would have liked. Jim, I was at an advantage because I had been with the White Sox, so I knew the American League clubs better than most people. It's just it's the way it is when you're working for a team. I had been to winter ball maybe 15 straight years, scouting like heck with my staff, so I felt like I knew the player. And I went back, and I'm not going to say who I called, but I called a longtime mentor of mine. And I said, early in your time with a team, did you ever have a situation where you knew you should make the deal or do something, but everything internally says no? And this guy that I'm really thankful for said, Dan, listen, ultimately you're going to aggravate a lot of people on one of your moves. I don't know if I would start it out with your first one. If you're that emphatic that it's the right move, and he said, let me ask you a question. And, you know, you and I have had these relationships. He said, is this guy going to get in and play right away? No DH, okay? We had Eric Karos making 15 a year on a no trade. I wasn't going to be able to move him. So I realized, wow, I'd be aggravating the entire staff and balking on the entire staff with nowhere for him to play Probably not a card I should play, but I knew, I shouldn't say I knew he was going to be that good, but I knew he was going to be a really good player. I'd seen it enough in the Dominican. So I called Terry back and I said, Terry, I would love to do it. Can you give me a week to try to move Karos? And he said, absolutely. I couldn't move Eric. I did later on. Eric's another guy with great character, but he was towards the end of his career. Jimmy, I remember going to the driving range near my house after one of those days. Let's just say I swung the club a little harder and a little faster, realizing I was probably missing out. But you know what it did more than anything? It made me recognize what we had to do better. Um, Matt Slater, really talented guy, now with the Cardinals as an assistant GM. I elevated him from that point, made him the director of pro scouting, I don't think that existed before. I don't think that position existed. And I said, Maddie, all your role is going to be is to make sure guys get seen so this never happens. And I said to him, I will guarantee you David Ortiz becomes a good player, but I'm not going to do it because it would be the wrong first move. You know, we ended up making some really good trades from that point. And I think it was because of the misfortune of not being able to do that deal. Right. It's, it's amazing if you think about uh, if David Ortiz was a Dodger instead of a Red Sox. Like, um, unbelievable. You might still be the GM. No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I, tell you, I tell you one thing. I would, I, would have, I would have had a lot of people in Latin America really liking the Dodgers. For sure. For sure. All right. Let's finish with one more. Uh, Bo Jackson, a fun one. Bo Jackson, you got to have a Bo, like everyone has Bo Jackson story, but you guys, you got this chance to see him. He's like one of might talked about two sport athletes. He might be the best one I can remember. Football, baseball. I mean, would you agree on that? Before he got injured, or how do you? How do you? Uh... I saw his first at bat in the big leagues. Jimmy hit a ground ball to second base, ran a three six four to first, and Hank Bauer, the longtime scout, sitting right next to me, and he said, Danny. I don't think I got him right. And I turned to good old Hank, ex-Marine, great player, and I showed him my stopwatch, and he got 365. And I said, well, Hank, I guess I like him a little bit more than you. He's he's easily the best athlete I've ever seen play baseball. Jim, I'm really proud of the fact I'm the guy who signed him for the White Sox. I pursued the heck out of him. Um, Jerry Reinsdorf and Ron Schuller said I was obsessed. Well, I was. Um, because I thought he could make a difference on a young team that was about ready to win, and we were. And uh, Jackson is a great example of relationships. Dr. Jim Andrews was a dear friend. I used to play golf with him all the time when I went to our Birmingham affiliate. And uh, Dr. Andrews said, Danny, with your trainer, Herm Schneider, being so great, I think you've got a chance. Well, here's the fun part about it, Jim. The Swimex Corporation was looking for a place to park their new product, the new hydrotherapy pools. Herm Schneider's the best trainer I ever worked with. Hermie and I concocted a scheme where we'd put the Swimex in the new ballpark in an empty space we had, and maybe that would get Jackson healthy to the point where he could play. 
It was risky as heck. Sure enough, his first game with the White Sox, he hits a monster home run. I literally was in tears because I knew how hard he had worked with Herm to get back. You talk about character, Jimmy. Oh, my great athlete, best body in the world. But I'll tell you what, on an artificial hip, the things he did, I saw him dunk with an artificial hip. Now, vertically challenged, yes, I am. I saw that, and I went, wow. Artificial hip, and he's dunking. Bring it on. Let's go. That's a great story. Hey, by the way, uh, you were there with Jordan was playing in the minor leagues? The whole time, absolutely. Give me a Jordan story. We got to go. We got to finish with a Jordan story. Oh, my favorite Jordan story is an easy one. It's not on the field. Um, it's really fun. Actually, can I tell two? Is that all right? Sure. Yeah, yeah. My little girl, my daughter was about four years old in the White Sox clubhouse in December, and I brought her to the ballpark. Michael was working. You remember, Michael was working very quietly to try to work on his skills. My little girl looks up at him, and she says, Michael Jordan, my daddy says you're not a very good baseball player and maybe you'll be going back to basketball if you don't get better. And she runs away. Well, I knew Mike really well. And I love him to this day. He's one of the best people I've ever been around. And he looks at me and he goes, hmm, Danny, how do you feel about that? So I laughed and he said, I love it. The innocence of a kid telling you the truth. Um, he would have been a big leaguer, Jim, no doubt. My favorite Jordan story, though, is Terry Francona, Jordan, and I go up to play in a charity golf tournament in St. Pete. Remember that Phillies tournament they had every year? Yes. So we go to a McDonald's in Michael's Range Rover because we're hungry on the way back. And Michael, being loyal to his brand, um, orders McDonald's. So Terry's in the back. I'm in the front. We're hanging out. And suddenly, I swear... 150 people surround the Range Rover. Michael B. and Michael start signing for every single person. I have never seen him turn down an autograph request. Fabulous character. Well, Terry and I are going, all right, are we ever going to get our food? So Michael signs everybody. It's maybe 20 minutes. We hold up the line forever. We get to the window. We get our food. I will never forget his order. It was a chocolate shake, fries, and a filet of fish. So we start to go around, and the crowd stops us again. Well, Terry, being a fun prankster, grabs the bag and starts eating Michael's filet of fish sandwich, eats his fries. He signs for another maybe 200 people. And then he looks in the bag and he goes, It's either you or you, one of you guys, whoever it is, you're both guilty. And here's the problem. I'm hungry. We're getting back in line. He drives around the McDonald's, gets back in line. And the guy, the guy at the counter says, uh, or on the speaker says, anything else? And Michael goes, yeah, two new friends, if you don't mind. He wouldn't order us anything. We couldn't buy anything. So we pull up to the window, still probably 50 people. And he turns to us and he says, you know I'm signing for every one of them. So get really comfortable. Well, we pulled away. We got back on the, I think that's a 75 going back to Sarasota. That's as hard as I've laughed in my entire life. Because he kept saying to Terry, maybe every five minutes, so how's that filet of fish, Terry? Was it good? How were the fries? So the rest of the spring that year, Michael would always go up to Tito and say, hey, you want to go out to lunch this afternoon? And Terry would always say, no, I don't do lunch with you. It's okay. They turned out to be the best of friends. But it was a great example of Jordan's character, but also Jordan's playfulness. But Francona is one of the most fun guys in the world. And the two of them together, I was with them a ton that year. That was truly hilarious to watch the two of them go at it after he had eaten his lunch. That's amazing. I, I love Jordan's stories. That's one I've not, I've not heard before. Danny, I always appreciate the time. Some great stories. Great to catch up. I mean, you've had an unbelievable career and some of those names. Uh, that's uh, quite, 
uh, a testament to the job that you did in uh, as an executive, but as a general manager too. So those are some amazing names. Thank you for the time and we'll be uh, in touch down the road. Thanks, Jim. Always enjoy spending time with you.